Watch out, it's popping YouTube. So I was trying to finish Frugal Wizard's Guide to Surviving Medieval England, but it's really boring and not very good. It could have been a lot better. It could have been slightly better written. So I might end up DNFing it, but I decided to read something else in the meantime. Something that was pretty good. With Stephen King's Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption. So this is one of Stephen King's best works. Most people know the movie with Morgan Freeman, but I think a lot fewer people have read the book. But I'm the opposite. I read the book, but I've never seen the movie. So anyway, let's just get into it. We're not in a prison drama, are we? We are in a prison drama. This is the fucking Shawshank Redemption, right? But with more tunneling through shit, no fucking redemption. So the entire story is narrated by this Irish dude called Red, who is currently serving a life sentence in high security shithole called Shawshank. Basically, the very not Morgan Freemanish Red killed his wife by cutting her brake lines because she had a nice fat life insurance policy out on her. Unfortunately, his wife also had picked up one of their friends and said friend's young daughter along the way, and you know, they all died in the crash, and so, um, quite rightfully, he gets sent to the slammer. So he's scum of the earth, basically. And, um, he is basically, you know, the guy who can get you stuff in prison. That's how he introduces himself, and that's his, like, claim to fame. So anyway, one day he meets this guy called Andy DeFrentz. Do friends? I think that's how it's pronounced. I'm gonna roll with that. Anyway, who is this banker who just got sent to Shawshank for double homicide? And he claims he's innocent, and he actually is innocent, unfortunately for him. But basically, his wife was having an affair with this golf pro dude, and one day after he found out, both wifey and Happy Gilmore ended up shot dead. Andy, who was getting sloshed at the country club, um, had also bought a gun recently because he was thinking about killing himself. Um, so it doesn't look very good for him. To be fair to law enforcement, you know, hella sus situation, and. Uh, he doesn't really put up that good of a defense. So anyway, he gets sent off to Shawshank for life. So he stuffed 500 bucks up his ass, smuggle it into the prison, um, and yeah, everyone thinks he's a bit pretentious and he gets raped a bit, but uh, he becomes pally with Red and gets him to, you know, get him a few things using that 500 smackaroos. So he gets a rock hammer, so he can like smash up rocks in the courtyard and polish them up and stuff and rock collect. Um, but anyway, later he also gets a poster of Rita Hayworth, which Red assumes is so he can, you know, have a cheeky wank. But um, we'll get there again later. As the book goes on, you know, over the years he replaces the poster with other girls to thirst over. But um, Rita Hayworth is the one from the title, so... Anyway. So anyway, things continue, and uh, while working on this shed, Andy gets jumped by some dudes, but he manages to get out of it by giving one of the guys advice on how to get some, like, inheritance money he just got to be tax-free to his wife. Um, so after that, he's no longer the prison pincushion, and a bunch of the guards and wardens and other inmates uh, start using him for financial advice. And the guards and wardens are doing a lot of illegal shit, so he's basically laundering money for them. And so he gets a bunch of, like, preferential treatment. He gets to run the library, and he gets to keep his own little cell and have it all to himself. However, the warden changes, and they get this Bible-bashing hypocrite who is into all sorts of religious stuff. The righteous man is beset on all sides by the inequities of the selfish and the tyranny of evil men. Blessed is he who in the name of charity and goodwill shepherds the weak through the valley of darkness, for he is truly his brother's keeper and the finder of lost children. And I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance. However, while New Warden realizes the full potential of Andy, this Native American guy ends up in Andy's cell, and once everything gets straightened out again, he makes a comment to Red about how there's an awful draft there. So anyway, Andy DeFrance keeps working for the corrupt warden, and then this guy gets transferred into the prison who claims he had a cellmate a while ago. And after meeting Andy, he realises that his old cellmate was actually the guy who killed Andy's wife and the golfer guy. It was a robbery gone wrong, and um, basically is what it's alluded to, but the guy was bragging about how, you know, he killed these two people, and then some lawyer is doing uh, time in a shithole somewhere for him. Um, although Andy is a banker, so... Anyway, and he goes off to the warden to try and get a retrial, give this new information, but he gets sent off to solitary because the warden is A, a shithead, and B, Andy knows, you know, all the illegal stuff he does and uh, could take him down. Andy only relents after the warden threatens to take away his cell, however. Uh, Andy then talks to Red about how he has this, like, entirely false identity waiting for him in the outside world, and um, that one of his accounting friends who recently died helped him sort out. Uh, he says he's going to, you know, go down to Mexico and run a small hotel after he gets out. Um, but Red sort of poo-poos this. But anyway, after like 30 years of, you know, being in prison, Andy just disappears. He doesn't show up for roll call in the morning. And basically it turns out that he's been tunneling through his wall for the last 25 years or so with the rock hammer. And he's been using the poster to cover up the work. He tunneled into the wall and down into this big sewer pipe thing and then escapes. And he runs off down to Mexico and gets away. 
Many years later, Red finally gets out on parole and realises he can't assimilate back into normal life after being in prison for so long, so he considers going back to prison, but then realises that if Andy could tunnel through a solid wall for decades and then crawl through a pipe of actual shit to get out, that he should, you know, stay out of prison. So he goes to the secret place where Andy had told him his secret identity was going to be hidden and finds a note written specifically for him, inviting him to come down to Mexico. And uh, the story then ends with Red running off down to Mexico. I sure hope he speaks Spanish. So this story is really good. Um, you know, it's a very short and sweet little read, and I would highly recommend this one to people. It's like 100 pages, I think. Even if you're not a big Stephen King fan, and honestly, if especially if you're not a big Stephen King fan, this is pretty different from his usual stuff. Um, I've sort of got two main things to talk about here, but first I'm going to talk about the sort of themes and deeper content of the book, and then I'm going to go talk about Stephen King just a, just a little bit. So this book's thematic content is pretty simple on the surface. Um, it deals with issues of the prison system, basically. The story shows a person that's innocent being forced to waste his life away inside a horrible prison. I mean, that's an imp that enough is an interesting premise. From the Andy standpoint, this story is a story championing the indomitability of the human spirit. This man tunnels through a wall of, for over two decades and crawls through shit, never once, you know, quitting until he gets free. He takes one of the worst fates someone can have and beats it. But the greater societal content is pretty interesting too. First off, the book makes Red very likeable, but this guy is literally a triple homicide murderer. So, I mean, I know he didn't mean to kill the kid and, like, the friend, but this guy literally killed his wife for money. So there is a question of, is he worthy of redemption? You know, that's one of the greater themes here. The Shawshank Redemption is not about Andy, it's about Red. Because Andy doesn't need redemption, because he didn't do anything. But Red is, you know... You forget when you're reading it, but... He did do the crime. Is Red worthy of redemption? And the book doesn't ask this for us, it's sort of left up to your own interpretation. Um, it doesn't have a hard stance on it, it sort of gives you the facts. It is from his perspective too, so that kind of does muddy the water a little bit. But um, on another note, this book deals with sort of the corruption in the prison system, you know, with the guards and wardens being criminals as well. The only difference being that, you know, they are not in prison, but the other guys aren't. But at the same time, they literally are in prison. So, you know. Um, there's even a bit at the end where um, the warden gets irate after Andy escapes and, and threatens to fire the um, the head guard guy, who then basically gives him his resignation, but then turns out he's still working there as if he is trapped there as well uh, in the job, I guess. But So that's a little thematic little bit. That's kind of cool. The book also touches briefly on the quite unspoken issue of sort of ex-convicts attempting to reassimilate themselves into normal life and how most of them can't and basically talks about how prison is a revolving door and um, how you know us normal people you know how we view ex-convicts in real life and and should prisons be punitive or rehabilitative re re should prisons be for rehabilitation or for you know punitive measures and um it doesn't really give you an answer on any of this, it just sort of exists. It's a really well-executed exploration of um, of these themes. And um, so now I need to have a word on writing. See what I did there? Anyway, Stephen King is basically the best... He's one of the best American writers ever. And while I love his longer fiction, like The Dark Tower, I find his style really suffers in that medium, to be honest. Um, King's strengths are in character and atmosphere, and he kind of sucks with endings and good setups to payoffs. But in his, you know, in his shorter fiction, this isn't really an issue. It's obvious that he kind of knew where he was going here, and he lets the character work lift the bulk of the story. He doesn't give himself time to get, you know, weighed down in the sort of Stephen Kingisms that most of his books end up being burdened with. Um, I mean, to be honest, Stephen King really excels in short fiction. Um, over over long fiction. I mean, the amount of Stephen King books I've read where I'm like, really? That's where we're ending? Like, I, I read all this for that? Like, The Stand, I don't know the ending of that. Uh, I mean, Insomnia was an absolute mess. I mean, like, I guess Revival was alright. And Mr. Mercedes was kind of interesting. And I love the ending of the Dark Tower series, but... I don't know, he does struggle with endings, and, um, and, and in these sort of shorter mediums, it really strips away a lot of his issues and lets him really thrive. And, um... I mean, if you want to check out something with Stephen King without having to pay for it, because you can find a lot of the stuff for free online, that's really short. I'd recommend reading The Jaunt. It's a really good sci-fi horror. Um, it's like a Black Mirror episode, kind of. 
Um, really, really good. Really, really good um, short story. Um, I'd highly recommend that. I can't remember what short story collection it's in, but but I have found it online before, just like for free, and um, it's it's fantastic, fantastic stuff. And um, that's the Shawshank Redemption. It's really good. It's not really that groundbreaking, I don't feel, and at least not anymore. This book was released in 1982, so maybe it was a little bit more cutting edge back then. But these days, it's sort of it's nothing amazingly noteworthy. Um, at least not in the issues it attempts to tackle. I feel they're all kind of pretty bog standard talking points these days. Um, but you know, it's sort of the execution that makes us stand out. Um, and obviously, it helps having you know a very, very uh, well-respected film made after the book. Sort of helps prolong the book's life, I guess. Um, I'm going to give this a five out of five. I would highly recommend. Um, and if you've never read Stephen King before, you could jump into this and. Um, not a great reflection of his usual writing because it is in first person and a lot of Stephen King stuff is not um, and it's got no supernatural elements but if you want to read something that is not a 5 out of 5 and it's not by Stephen King you can check out my short story Mal the Graveyard Man or my novella The Seraph of Kitch they are both up for free on my website and if you want to actually pay for something All the Hell the Carrying King is still kicking around Amazon so I have a lot of options now and um, remember to like and share and subscribe and thank you very much and I will hopefully see you all next time.